When it comes to self-development, the vital point is to practice. It's not about the path you choose, but the steps you take on your journey. If you're ready to transform and alchemize your unique purpose, then you've tuned in to the right frequency. Welcome to the Vital Point Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Schechter. As a transformation coach and breathwork facilitator, I'm invested in making the dynamic landscape of personal evolution accessible. My goal is to inspire you to take action for yourself. You have the capacity to transform, grow, and bring your dreams to life. With so many diverse and powerful modalities at our fingertips, this podcast aims to be more than just a conversation. It's an interactive guide providing not only knowledge, but also hands-on practices from meditations to breath work, from journaling exercises to real life transformation techniques. I'll share my own experiences while also spotlighting those who are walking their paths and embodying what they teach. Because at the heart of transformation, the key is not just to learn, but to practice. That's the vital point. Are you ready to move from theory to practice, from passive listening to active transformation? Let's do more than just discuss change. Let's integrate it together. Just as words don't cook rice and hearing about push-ups won't make you stronger, remember the vital point is to practice. Let's begin this journey together. My guest on today's show is Colombian American integrative physician, Dr. Joe Tafour. After completing his family medicine training at UCLA, Dr. Tafour spent two years in academic research at the UCSD Department of Psychiatry. After his fellowship research over a period of six years, he lived and worked in the Peruvian Amazon at the traditional healing center, Neo Rao Centro Espiritual, training there as an ayahuasquero. In his book, The Fellowship of the River, A Medical Doctor's Exploration into Traditional Amazonian Plant Medicine, through a series of stories, Dr. Tafour shares his unique experience and integrative medical theories. He's currently a fellow at the University of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. With his spiritual community in Phoenix, Dr. Tafour co-founded the Church of the Eagle and the Condor. Dr. Tafour is also a co-founder of the nonprofit Modern Spirit. Among their projects is the Modern Spirit Epigenetics Project, Project an analysis of the epigenetic impact of MAPS MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And this was really a wonderful conversation about the uh, connection between the medicine world, the psychedelic world, and the medical and science world. And one of the areas that we dipped into is that spirit and heart are one of the bridges and the connections between these two worlds. Uh, and how the results that people are having with connecting to the spirit, whether that's with psychedelic medicines like ketamine, MDMA, ayahuasca, um, and breath work as well, uh, speak for themselves. And whether or not science and medicine can fully explain what's happening basically becomes less relevant in the face of the results that patients are seeing in the res in the reduction to their PTSD, to the anxiety, to their depression, to their addiction, um, the self-reported effects speak to themselves and are becoming more and more difficult to ignore. And also how connecting to these spiritual spaces uh, transcends religious and political ideologies. So we get into different elements of healing and integration, bringing in the uh, traditional uh, healing beliefs from cultures like uh, the Shipibo, the Navajo, even talking about uh, some of the Tibetan teachings and getting into, you know, some of the more modern integration methods as well. 
speaking of this spiritual connection to the heart space, one of the methods to access this is breath work. It's really a doorway into the expanded state of consciousness. And so I'd like to invite you to join me for Breathwork for Transformation, the second and fourth Sunday of each month online on Zoom. There's also a third session uh, around the full moon that's uh, available for subscribers. Breathwork for Transformation blends neurodynamic breathwork, somatic awareness, and meditation into a harmonious whole that can facilitate emotional release, foster deep creative insights, and usher in an unparalleled sense of relaxation. And these sessions are great for everyone, whether you're a seasoned breathwork enthusiast or a newcomer curious to step onto the path of self-care. These sessions are perfect for you. My participants regularly testify about the transformative power of our offerings, citing improvements in their meditation practice, enhanced integration of plant medicine experiences, and greater understanding of their subconscious minds. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Okay, Dr. Joe Tafour, welcome to the Vital Point podcast. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Nice to be here. Yeah. So the the Vital Point, uh, the name of the show kind of came from this Buddhist uh, you know, teaching where there's this three lines that really sums up the entire Buddhist sort of teaching and canon. Um, but there's this book behind me in several hundred pages, as you can see, that, uh, you know, is commentary on that. So, you know, th that these three lines can go out into, uh, you know, literally hundreds of pages that we can speak about. And so for me, when we're talking about integration, when we're talking about using these medicines, um, like you're really versed in, uh, for transformation, the, the vital point is that we have to actually think about integrating and, you know, how we sort of process and think about, uh, what the medicine is, is showing us with the messages that we're, um, receiving. So I know you had asked about the vital point and I just wanted yeah. to, uh, <laughs> I was just wanted to, wondering what are, if that what are the three lines, so what are the three lines and what does it mean? The point one is introduced directly to one's own nature. One definitively decides upon this unique state. One continues directly with confidence and liberation. So it's really about just seeing the, the Buddha nature, the nature of mind, mm. which I would say in the ayahuasca space, for me at least, is one of those times where I felt like I could connect to that nature, to that mm. true, to that true self. Yeah, I mean, it has that potential, right? It definitely has that potential. And so that's why uh, people, you know, use it sacramentally, like within spiritual practice, you know, for to, uh, to try to access that, you know, for themselves. Yeah, it seemed like it gave me a, a framework, uh, you know, the Buddhist understanding of, oh, some of these things that I've read about, and maybe I've thought about them or, you know, heard a teacher talk about it, uh, you know, from a intellectual basis. But then in that ayahuasca space, I felt like I could understand it better. Um, like I was really experiencing it, including some of the things that I think you talk about, um, in terms of the energies, the energies that maybe are all around us all the time mm -hmm. that we're not really, uh, perceiving during the normal, uh, sort of day to day life that we have. Right. And I think, isn't that within, I don't know how that is within the Buddhist teachings that you've uh, explored, but are related to this vital point. Is that part of it with them? Is that part of their um, spectrum of understanding? Yeah. Yeah. For instance, um, like my main teacher is known for using uh, what's called a prayer wheel. And inside this wheel that turns is millions of prayers and mantras. And the idea that as the as the prayer wheel turns and as the user's sort of mind is intent on sending these prayers out, that the energy is actually going out into, you know, into the world, into the room, into the environment. And when like, I could understand that intellectually, okay, you're, you're spinning this wheel and there's something energetically that's happening. 
And, you know, I've, I've used this, you know, practice myself, but it's almost like an imagination, right? But then there's been medicine experiences where I've picked up the wheel and started to, to work with it. And I felt like I could actually feel the energy in the room actually changing, like almost like waves of energy kind of coming out of, of the wheel um, into the environment. And then sitting, <laughs> sitting in an ayahuasca ceremony and listening to the Icaros was where it kind of clicked of, oh, this is the same, this is the same idea. This is the same concept where the, the Icaros are actually working with these energies in the room. And I'm definitely not an expert, so I'd, I would love to hear, you know, your thoughts yeah. on that or if, if well, I'm... I, mean, I think it's, it's like, you know, so this energy in the room, you know, that's the question mm -hmm. mark. And so, I don't know, there's, it's like, to me, it's, of course, if you don't feel it or you don't sense it, you know, something like that, whether that's through meditation, arriving that, you know, I mean, I think your teacher is taught, developing this prayer wheel, right? It's not, it's not dependent on psychedelics. Right their practice or the evolution of their practice or this technology that they've created. Right. So mm -hmm. somehow just through meditation or through their spiritual practice, they arrived at this thing that for you, I guess it was difficult to imagine or, or to feel. And then I guess when the, the medicine space or, you know, in this case with ayahuasca, you were able to feel that energy. Right. Yeah. And, so, and that's, so the idea is that there's like a sensibility, you know, that exists. And so then this medicine or, you know, you had brought it up or what people would talk about, like hallucinations and imagination. It's like, yeah, there, there's a lot of room in the medicine space. And, you know, if you're under the influence of some sacramental substance or maybe a psychedelic substance, there's a lot of room for projection, you know, into that space with your imagination from your memory, from your thoughts, you know, that's true. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of ways you can fool yourself and there's a lot of foolishness around all of it. You know, you see it a lot. And so that's what people are kind of turned off by, you know, often because they see it's not, I don't know, some of it's expressed in a way that doesn't seem that thoughtful. And at the same time, like there is this honesty around, like you felt it, you know, right. And then somebody else is feeling it without taking the medicine. They're feeling it through their meditation and they're sharing about it and they're comparing notes about it. And so the idea is that there is something that exists, you know, uh, like a, you know, metaphysical phenomenon and, you know, the quantum physics implies a lot of mysterious things, you know, in addition to what people, if they're honest about their experience, yes, you know, most people have strange things happen to them that don't quite make sense, you know, through the rational explanation of how everything is supposed to work. So deep down, I think everyone knows it's, yeah, it's a little more complicated, you know, or we don't, nobody really understands, nobody really knows, you know, about all the ins and outs of all of it. So then what I see is that my experience is that getting like, closer to that to learning about the energy like that or trying to work with the energy like that and that's something i talk about a lot that access is kind of linked to your emotional apparatus of your body you know your heart space your feelings and so to get deeper with that you you have to get deeper with that emotional side of yourself you know so overly rational approach like you're not gonna access it very well. And that's very common to see that, that people who are very logical, very rational, very intellectual trying to approach these things, they don't experience it. And then maybe because of a medicine experience or a psychedelic experience, you know, it shifts the way their mind is working. And so they can't do their usual, like, you know, egoic uh, little patterns that they've been using to kind of, you know, go through their, their world. And so then they, they gain access to, you know, different parts of themselves. And so that's a very vulnerable place, really, you know, like the same place that you would come into contact with these energies or become more aware of these things is the same place where you're going to find like some of your deepest wounds, you know, mm. some of your, uh, 
most uncomfortable emotional experiences, they're going to be there. And so, you know, you that do breath work, it's like you see this happen to people in breath work, right? Right. People in breath work access uh, a lot of mystical phenomena. That's not uncommon at all. I mean, they have major emotional experiences many times, like a lot of emotional catharsis. And mm -hmm. also, they, uh, the, the veil, you know, between their apparent reality starts to blur. Haven't you? Yeah. You've experienced that? Oh, yeah. Myself and definitely mm -hmm. with clients. <laughs> Right. That's yeah. kind of common. So that kind of implies like that there's something going on. Right. You know, so the breath work is is changing the way their brain is working. It's allowing them to kind of bypass some of their ego structure and get more into like a deeper body sense of themselves and a deeper emotional sense of themselves. And it's through that uh, connection and exploration that they, you know, they, they, they find these, whatever they work through these traumas, they work through energy from the past and they also gain like a bigger access to mystical, you know, awareness that, uh, you know, they have strange experiences that they have to kind of figure out how they're going to integrate that into their system of thinking or whatever they want to call it, you know, but the reality is that they experienced it. And if you were right there, well, then you experienced it. Yeah. So you, people, you could call it a hallucination or whatever they want to call it, but emotionally something very real happens that has a major impact on, on the person and even the person observing. It's that feeling, um, the emotion right. of it, right? Like there's, when it happens, there's no, the, the thinking and analytic part just kind of turns off. Like there's no questioning it. You, cause you feel it, you, well, you're you, there. It turns out the analysis is probably always after the feeling. Hmm. So the society, like I said, which is not really supporting like these vulnerable places within ourselves is like leaning so heavily, you know, into the, the thinking. But then as we like explore more and more, whether it's neuroscience or, you know, meditation or it like maybe like almost of the thinking is actually like just secondary to the feeling. So how can we start to develop that trust in the heart? and the feeling rather than relying yeah. so much on the, the thinking. Yeah, that's a great question. And so it's like the spaces and places that you're supporting, you know, so then that's what I say. It's like, so people need the society, the culture, I believe needs like, and this is something you see a little more commonly in, in traditional culture or different parts of the world where, where there is more kind of mystical awareness or energetic awareness and, and some of the things that that brings. In some cases, you know, uh, it can like, even sometimes more harmonious relationships with the ecosystem, you know, are related to that kind of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so what we see a lot of times, you know, there's different people that have made comment about it. I, you know, I say like creating spaces for people, what I would call a ceremonial space, where it's a place where they can, they're safe, like truly safe, where they can be vulnerable and where there's no judgment. And so the lack of judgment also like implies that the people holding that space are working to transcend their own judgment. You know, that they're not projecting a lot of their own judgment into the space that create that judgmental space. So we have that problem of like a lot of spiritual opportunities for the people right now. It's not safe, you know, they, some of them, yes, I'm not trying to say across the board, but some, like, let's say some church environments, some religious environments where people would go to hope to try to get, you know, go deeper with their feeling and go deeper into their spiritual connection. Like, that's kind of like the purpose of that kind of thing. Right. You know, originally. And so then the problem is that if it's not safe, you know, they're going to be harmed or whatever, then they can't really open up. They can't really trust. They can't really be vulnerable because they're going to have to be vulnerable you know, which is uncomfortable and awkward. And then there can't be judgment against them, you know, over what they're going to express or what they're going through. And so there's a lot of judgment, you know, in a lot of these religious environments right now that so then it, it blocks uh, people being able to really open up that way. So there's, you know, there are other environments, you know, there's a, there are other spiritual practice environments and even religious environments where I think these things are more, I would say, like consciously addressed for their role in helping people um, heal and evolve and grow. 
that that's like in the you know traditional perspective and like some indigenous perspectives you know the spiritual growth and the healing are the same thing mm -hmm. so then the conditions that would promote either one would be this you know the same and so we are if you're doing integration with people after they go through whatever maybe they go through a psychedelic experience maybe they go through they're in a rehab you know they're going through something and so you know creating environments uh and then the other big thing that you know uh maladoma so the african healer always talked about from uh he's from burkina Faso that passed away is like well nature community and spirituality so like some kind of access to nature some community supporting the process and then the uh the tolerance of the spiritual discussion you know the spiritual discussion is not limited to just like a very like a skew intellectual like what's that over there but like hey you know is that something that can nourish you to be connected you know is it something helpful not to fool yourself or to delude yourself but is there something helpful in understanding our relationship to the mystery you know the metaphysics of it the quantum physics of it and so you know an example like this it was a new one from the maps conference for me was this year uh this group from emory university in atlanta who's like chaplains and spiritual healthcare providers within the modern western healthcare system you know so that's an interesting example the chaplaincy that that still exists within our culture established it's not being driven out of the hospitals you know they allow the chaplains to be there in many cases and and they provide uh, you know what's supposed to be a universal support regardless of religious belief like that already exists in our system in our society and our culture and so then the chaplains are one of the groups that had been uh, were being considered and have been considered and have been included like in the MDMA you know assisted therapy with the MAPS trial and the FDA approval like who is allowed to be in the room with those people do they have to be licensed you know what kind of training or experience would the fda require for somebody to sit for somebody else while they're on mdma do they have to be a psychologist you know what kind of skill set would be helpful and supportive in such an experience and so the chaplains have always been you know kind of one of the roles that has been thought to be accepted and integrated there and so then these guys this group was related to divinity school i think at emory university published in jama you know journal of american medical association on certs certs cert is a spiritual emotional or no spiritual existential religious or theological experience and so they're saying well you know these certs are here they are there they exist you know from an observation if we ask people they'll tell us they had this and it says in the psychedelic assisted therapy field the cert is very common right you know so there's another thing to observe and note as scientists you know the analytical observation is yes that's that would be considered real and then second lastly that the cert experience is clinically relevant to the psychedelic assisted therapy what they go through in these certs turns out to be effect their health directly so then now we see this metaphysical like interaction with physical mental emotional health uh documented and published you know in jama and so it's like we're beginning to to face these things you know that it's like hey these people were not getting better uh the ones in this study they're you know addicts and the psilocybin study or end of life anxiety in psilocybin study or they were and this is mostly psilocybin research you know mdma that people do have uh, you know supernatural experiences uh in some of those sessions maybe less common but it does exist so when it does happen you know they find it to be clinically relevant and so and those are people who had this trauma that couldn't heal for years and years and years so then they're like okay well I guess we need to learn about how to deal with these certs because they said you know we found out that the adverse childhood experience 
the ACE is a big deal and right. we need to learn how to manage that because it's clinically relevant and it comes up a lot in psychedelic assisted therapies. So we need to learn more about how we're going to deal with that. Similarly, we need to learn more about how we're going to deal with these certs and maybe we need to bring, you know, religious, uh, spiritual practitioners into the fold to help us work with these things because they have more, uh, direct experience. You said so many cool things there that I want to ask about. Um, sure. As far as the certs, do you have a sense that the medical or science community, it, like, how do they explain that? Or is it there's, does the result that is measurable in terms of data, um, sort of supersede the need to understand it? Yeah, it supersedes it, I believe, because these are reports. This is no one's claiming that everyone, anyone knows what it is, mm -hmm. you know, or trying to preach to everybody else. This is what it is. I know it and you don't know it. You know, that's what's really boring about like the, the analytical approach to spirituality. It's like, well, they're just trying to find the absolute truth. But then, you know, the absolute, they don't know what it is. Nobody does. Right. Like I said, they don't even know how your brain works. You know, they know some things about it. They don't know everything about it. And so... It's okay. That's okay. We don't have to like stop everything because we don't have it all explained. Yeah. You know, it's okay to talk about it. It's okay to live. It's okay to be alive and not understand that completely. You know, it doesn't bother a dog, you know, to not have that analytical like comprehension of the neuroscience in their brain. So as we move forward, there's many examples and, you know, the, the simplest example within the the mental health field is like the, the psychological scales. So they ask people, you know, about a depression scale. They ask people about an anxiety scale. They ask people about, you know, how's their sleep? So this is subjective reports. How do you feel, you know, when you wake up in the morning, do you feel like this? Do you feel like you have a hard time, you know, finding pleasure in the activities that you used to enjoy? Do you find yourself like, uh, you know, wrapped up in fearful thoughts for, you know, most of the day? It's like these are subjective questions. Mm -hmm. They're reporting this to you. So you believe them that that's their experience. You could walk away and blow them off. Oh, phew, they just can't figure it out. You know, they need to let it go. But it's there. It's published. It's evidence. And, and it turns out it's clinically relevant. Like those scales are being used to track people's progress. And now they're being correlated to like physiologic phenomena. Did their inflammation go down? You know, is their fight or flight response calming down after the PTSD treatment? And how are they scoring on their PTSD scale? That is the ultimate measure of the like PTSD research is this subjective scale. So, and so I'm just saying it's a normal part of mental health uh, tracking is subjective report from the patient because that's a, it's considered real. You know, we don't have to like, we, whether it is like an imaginary fantasy or just part of a monstrous illusion that no one understands within the realm of healthcare, it's okay to talk about that that's significant that what that person told you about how they feel, that that's useful to understanding how you might be able to help them, including whether or not you're going to use medication and assisting them to get better or not, you know, physical material uh, intervention. So, so I would just say it's there. So now it's like, you know, they could fight it and say, no, we don't want to hear about that or just not, it's not politically correct or like acceptable to hear about these kind of experiences, you know, um, that people have, that if you did allow the self report to be there, then it would be, there it would be, you know, if you just ask around, you're going to hear a lot of these. It's just, it's up to you whether you want to listen or you don't want to listen, you know? Yeah. It's, it's so interesting. Like I often think about what it will be like, in you know 10 years 20 years 100 years um if the current sort of direction that we're moving in keeps going and i take it back to um 
an experience I had in an ayahuasca ceremony where the facilitators lit a fire and seeing and kind of experiencing the healing properties of that fire um, and that people have gathered around fire for healing for, you know, basically all, most of humanity. Right. Um, and that that's why there's some healing energy there maybe. Um, and the sort of the insight that came through as a result of that was that the things that we consider magic or that we can't explain, you could explain it through science. We just don't get it yet. Right. Like at some point in history, fire was magic. And then now we can explain it from science and the molecules that are working together with the air and, you know, all of that. Um, so I, I guess I'm just always curious part of the fire that's still magic huh right 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 but the but we thing. but we understand it a little bit more right so it's like when we're when we're talking about these things that are you know the quote unquote woo woo uh the energy stuff the the things that some of these more ancient wisdom lineages whether we're talking about the shipibo or the tibetans or you know native americans that they understand and like i'm, I'm curious where what we're going to understand as we put that scientific yeah. lens into it, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's always value and not maybe not always, but there's a lot of value in like the scientific, you know, assessment is like, it's fun to, and that's the idea of this Eagle and the condor prophecy that we're in this time when the science and the spiritual and the heart and the mind, you know, start to respect each other. Yeah. And so this idea is like, okay, if you're just intellectual and you're just, you know, you're bringing that arrogance of like, oh, these dumb savages, they think fire is magic. I know what fire is. It's the combusting of these, you know, of this wood and that's this car, blah, 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 you know, and the light and this is how it's made. And, you know, they have all that explanation, but then somehow their approach with the Western analysis is falling very short uh, and a lot of aspects of society, you know, major uh, mental health crisis, major ecological disequilibrium, but major, you know, as far as like the elevated position, it's like ridiculous, mm -hmm. you know, from, from a global perspective, it's, it's not very impressive, you know, to see society uh go in certain directions so that's so the the humility of the like hyper intellectual perspective it's like it's it's just whether or not they want to accept it it's it's obvious you know major failure in in mental health mm. like major and uh major failure around you know ecological whatever awareness and sustainability so it's not that impressive. It is cool, like to be able to use a cell phone and do all, you know, it's helpful. It's amazing. The internet, here we are. So many okay. major advances. It's incredible. It's amazing. It's uh -huh. made out of the earth. You know, this computer is made out of the earth. Mm. That's what it's made out of. Right. Like, is that is that magic? It's like, well, you know, there's part of it that seems kind of magical. I think, you know, like staring into the fire. Here I am looking at you. There's something kind of uh, extra ordinary about it. Then there's the path of the heart and, you know, the sitting around the fire and then they're kind of, you know, that side, the heart side, kind of resentful, you know, broken hearted, like upset about all the pain, you know, that has been caused by some of the kind of arrogant um, and kind of neglectful, like a lot of the disregard that the intellectual like, oh, get over it, you know. Who cares about your feelings? And so there's just like resistance from the heart space of like, it's not safe. It's not, this isn't good, you know, to, to open up here. But then it's like, okay, well, the way things are, we have to open up more again. And so this idea of a lot of indigenous cultures, you know, starting to share their wisdom, you know, like you mentioned with the Shipibo or the other ones that are like sharing with the culture or in the cultures that in many cases, you know, have been very, very um, dismissive, you know, of their existence, like dramatically. So, you know, right. like willing to have for the convenience of having some oil or some gold or 
at your fingertips, you know, if they were to be eradicated and you found out later, you know, you'd be like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe you would have a who knows how much attention would be given to that or is given to that, you know, with the regular phenomenon that it is. So all that's going on. And so then as you see what I see, what I think could happen, and this is what I'm observing, is that as you, as this trauma-informed healing grows, when they say, hey, you know what, it's not enough, it's not just in their head, like they need somatic experiencing, they need breath work, they need internal family systems, we need to get past this purely brain model. The brain model is not effective. So it apparently is, is, is inadequate, you know, especially if you're actually trying to help someone, you know, if it's just making a drawing to show somebody what you drew, you know, that can be very impressive. But if you're actually trying to help an individual, you know, then it turns out we have to go beyond that. And so we have to get into these. So the trauma informed healing is kind of making its way through the, you know, the system. It's like, if you are not trauma informed and realizing the way that some of this trauma and these ACEs and all these experiences could be feeding into like all these long-term health problems, then it's like, you're kind of behind. Right. You know, the science, the analysis is teaching us that. The analysis is establishing that in fact, and in the biology, it's not just an idea or a concept or imagination or a vision. This is biochemically, you know, observed for those that are like more, you know, interested in that dimension of things. And so that's going on. And so then, oh, well, we have to deal with this trauma informed healing. So now we need approaches that will adequately address trauma or more effectively address trauma. And so then they start expanding into these other areas, whether that's, you know, you see some of that happening in these sacred ceremonial work. We see a lot of that happening in the psychedelic assisted therapy work. We see a lot of it supported by psychotherapy, by somatic experience therapy, by internal family systems, by breath work, you know, by EMDR or whatever, all these different ways that by, you know, integration circles and community support and peer support in AA and in rehab, you know by, uh, you know, f further exploration into people's spiritual practice and spiritual connection and the impact that that could have, you know, in helping people emotionally regulate and get through, you know, some trauma experience that they have. As they start doing that, and that starts growing, I guess people realize, okay, that model, that way of thinking was like, yeah, it was the very, they're very loud. They really didn't want to hear from anyone else, but it wasn't really working. And so now the people that are suffering, it's the suffering that will eventually shove it, you know, forward because the people and their families, you know, and their loved ones and their children, it's too much to bear to just hang your hat on a, on a system of thought, hmm. you know, if that system of thought is too disconnected from what's happening and you're going to watch a loved one, you know, go through some torment you know, it's going to break your heart, whether you believe that you have a heart to break or not. And so that happens. And so then those people are looking and they're looking and they're looking and they're looking and they're finding and they're finding treatments and ways that are like, whoa, this is doing this. And then what's curious is that these treatment spaces, you know, they they whether they, let's talk about, you know, PTSD and, you know, at the MAPS conference, Rick Perry, you know, the ex-governor of Texas, um, self-proclaimed at the MAPS conference, knuckle-dragging right-winger, supposedly, but, you know, a heartfelt person that expressed a lot of things that people could relate to. And eventually he just said, you know, this the vets were getting helped by psychedelic-assisted therapies, and he couldn't deny it. And so we have to learn about this because these people, their lives are more important than your reputation or what you thought your reputation was. So then you allow these treatments to grow and there, whether it's ketamine assisted therapy here in Phoenix, Arizona or in Tucson, you know, just like pop up here, there. And it's like, cause it's always trauma and we need something that'll help with the trauma. And this is going to help with the trauma and it might open a cert, but we're willing to take that risk 
you know, we'll deal with it if it comes and we'll go with it. And you see that as these really vulnerable spaces and places are being cared for in these people in a context that is much broader, you know, that allows for some transcendent experiences, they start healing, you know, in ways that was not previously, you know, observed. They were not previously observed. And as they start healing and it becomes more commonplace to heal in that such a way, the mystical awareness and the mystical connection grows through the society. Not for religious reasons, not because of like, you should believe this because if you don't believe this, you know, you're not with us, but because what you started with, because you felt it and it was real and it really made things different for you in your life and for your loved ones. And it seems to be somehow related to the fabric of things, you know, to this so-called vital point. It's like, it seemed to be related to me seeing myself and the way it is in its entirety, meaning beyond the lifespan, you know, like in its entirety, like the universe, I have a, that, that from that's the place maybe that we can somehow make sense of things from. You know, according to the Buddhists and to so many other like deep spiritual practitioners seeking, you know, um, some kind of harmony in their life's, you know, journey. And so it's the universal awareness, I believe, will grow. And I think the science will support the, you know, the, the clinically relevant. It's like. If it is, so then that's why I make a big deal about always, you know, I repeat it over and over again because they'll say like, oh, well, look here, I'm on this podcast. It's like, well, Joe has a church. He's part of a church and the ayahuasca is their sacrament and it's a spiritual practice. But here we're talking about healing and medicine and they call it medicine in the culture. And and so is that shouldn't that be, you know, in the realm of the, the medical, the therapeutics? And it's like, well, the traditional way in Chupibo in Peru, it is spiritual practice. It's regarded that way. And right. it is regarded that way in, in Native American culture always. Okay. And yes, it's true. Everyone accepts that it can impact your health. Yeah. And so because within the, the you know, indigenous, whatever approach framework, you know, this spiritual growth and healing are the same thing. And yes, it's true approaches that really um, effectively impact spiritual growth and effectively impact health that, yeah, they do, they do impact your physiology. And it's, it's quite, uh, it's easier to see sometimes in the emotional physiology, you know, and in the function of the brain and sometimes in other aspects of, of the physical body. So it's like, that's the thing. It's like, where does the rubber hit the road? You know, so that's fair to not believe in stuff that doesn't hit the road. Yeah. But to say the rubber doesn't hit the road anywhere is like, well, I don't know about that, you know? And so I think that we're, the suffering is pushing people to see, like, if, let's say, this spiritual rubber hits the road somewhere that can help us, well, we want to know about that. And that's what I see. And so when I'm working at a ketamine clinic in Phoenix, Arizona, as a doctor and seeing a number of people walking into the office and they're saying, I'm like, Oh, what brought you in? Why do you have to do the intake? Why are you here? Why do, well, how did you hear about it? What are you doing? So, you know, something's missing for me. I think something's missing. I think it's spiritual. I think what's missing for me is spiritual. And I think, uh, I don't know. I heard you guys might be able to help me find that. And I've heard that like several times from people here and, you know, you're from Arizona, like here in Phoenix. Tucson is a lot more, you know, curious about things like that than the average Phoenician. I don't know. That's what we, that's what the common idea. Uh -huh. So it's just like, <laughs> it's, it's strange, you know, it's happening. And so then I see them go through their deal and, and they say that kind of stuff. Like the guy's like, yeah, no, I think it's like, again, so they start talking, you know, I think I want to find something spiritual, but you know, for me, my experience with religion, it was just a lot of BS and it didn't do anything for me. And, you know, they were just shoving things down my throat and, and it's like, okay, so the spiritual practice, and I think any, you know, I'm not against any religion or anything, but I'm saying their spiritual practice, we should consider, and as I repeat this over and over, it's like we should consider its impact on the health. Right. Like if 
if spiritual practice really in its nature, the vital point, I think the Buddhists, the, the, those people that you're talking about would agree with me uh -huh. that this should be healthy for you. Your spiritual well-being should improve. Your mental health should improve. Your emotional health should improve. And your physical health, you know, why not? If you're feeling better and more resilient, then it should improve as well. So if the spiritual practices that you are engaged in are not doing that, you know, if they're making you feel worse mentally, if there's a, if there's like growing mental illness in your religious community, like that's a concern, you know, that's a concern <laughs> that it's not something that we're going to judge, but we should reflect on that. You know, how many people need to be medicated to participate in your spiritual practices? Mm. You know, what do they, do they find a connection in themselves to that, to, a, to a, a nourishing source. And many do. And I'm not trying to say no one does. Many do. But when there's, you know, so then around the religious trauma, we can kind of like use this as a guide of like, hey, okay, we don't, we're not against religion and that, but, you know, it's better be healthy if we're going to have it in our society, in our community. Yeah, the connection of the spiritual, you know, and bringing that, aspect into your life is uh so important and the, the i think what you're saying is that the that's one of the beauties of some of these medicines it whether you want to call them medicines or sacrament or right. you know psychedelic whatever is that it does open us up to that dimension and the experience beyond the analytical um one of the things that i thought of when you were speaking was like um you know, some people, I think we all, maybe a lot of people, I'll say that, uh, when they start to have these peak experiences or these spiritual experiences, the initial reaction is I want to share it with everyone and I want to like yell it from the rooftops. And yet, um, perhaps it's more valuable to just embody those changes and the things that you've experienced, because when you do that, then people start coming to you. Hey, what's different? You know, it's, you've, you're so different. You've changed or, you know, you used to be so depressed and you seem so happy now or whatever it is. Um, like the evidence speaks for itself. You know, you don't even have to say, Hey, this is what I did. I'm for psychedelics. Um, and I also like that you brought in the, you know, the sort of the more conservative viewpoint uh, I saw a meme the other day that had like a guy from Burning Man, you know, sort of if, if I say picture a guy at Burning Man, like what, exactly what you're thinking of right. and, a sol and a soldier on the other side. And it said, you know, name one issue that these two people agree on besides psychedelics, you know? So it's, it's amazing that, uh, that um. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing um, that, yeah. that, that it's bringing, bringing people together because Camping. of the result of camping. <laughs> yeah, a lot in common. There's a lot of soldiers <laughs> burning man, but go ahead. <laughs> but yeah, the, it's, it's amazing that the results that people are seeing are bringing, you know, these disparate groups together, um, yeah. you know, under, under a common, like, Hey, this is working. You know, we need to, to have more of it. And that's very beautiful. Yeah. And that, that was, that was the thing, right? When, at the MAPS conference, when Rick Doblin came up and gave his speech and his all white suit and his kind of a Burning Man icon, um, you know, and doing his thing. And then right after him, Rick Perry, you know, the governor of Texas, secretary of energy under Donald Trump, you know, like this is like as far into the right wing as you can get as the power structure. And he was the one saying, look, this is it's like and it's to me, it's that it's like the suffering is too great. Let's to give a break to the polarization. It's too many people's families. It's too many people's, you know, relatives. We're going to have to find some common ground. The common ground is healing, you know, and that's exciting, you know, because that's, but that's also like, to me, that's why I think health is like the bridge between science and spirituality. Right. I'm also curious, you know, you mentioned the clergy and the clergy being in, inserted and uh, accepted into 
the therapeutic setting because yeah. of their experience with the certs and with the spiritual aspect of life and sort of the mystical. Um, and it, it brings up something that I wanted to ask you um, because one of the things that I noticed at, at the maps conference that I think concerned me a little bit, just personally um, was the amount of people that were there that were curious about bringing psychedelic therapy or psychedelic medicines into their, their work that haven't had any of their own experiences. And so the difference between somebody like a clergyman who maybe has never worked with a psychedelic, but has a lot of experience with the spiritual aspect of life and the mystical versus somebody that goes and gets like a certification to, to do something, but has never done any of their own work. I would say that I would feel more comfortable with the clergy person um, supporting me in my experience. And do you agree? I mean, do you think that people need to have their own experiences to be facilitating and supporting people? I think that like in the initial, in the initial wave of like the clinical research with psychedelics, that because of the FDA approval and that process with the DEA, you know, they could not obligate, you know, people to, to have the psychedelic experience. You know, when you go through the MAPS training, there was, there was a huge thing that they were negotiating about, you know, how do we, do we have, do you have to have an experience to be completely certified? What kind of experience? So then breath work retreats were acknowledged, you know, uh-huh. as a potential for people that didn't, that wanted to practice this, but maybe they, maybe they didn't want to do ketamine or, or they don't have a legal access to MDMA or psilocybin. You know, they were trying to come up with ways, you know, could have a Vipassana retreat, like a nine day sit, you know, with that meditation, would that qualify? Well, there's a movement around that. Like that was, those were examples that you needed some experiential component to your training. A lot of the developing programs are interested in that, you know, as far as requiring that, I think that, um, Naropa also requires that over in Colorado, but it can be breath work. It can be ketamine. It can be something else, but something they feel like. So, you know, I just want to say that maybe a lot of people think that it should be a part of the required training, you know, and the obligation to make people do psychedelics who may be, you know, let's say they're great clergy people or they just really special in those spaces. Like maybe they don't need to do it. Okay. So they've done something else that would people would feel somehow comparable. So that's being negotiated out. You know, um, I think that at the beginning, and I think if you look at all the researchers that are part of the trials and the therapists that are in the trials, I'm not aware of any of them that are not experienced. So the the data that is being produced is based on that. Hmm. So it's not just like, oh, any old therapist. That's not true. All the therapists that are getting these incredible results on the MAP study, as far as I know, are experienced. So there will be a question mark around, like, should you obligate people? You know, I, I think you should encourage them. I think it seems like a great idea. It seems important. Um, can some people do it without having that? Probably. Are the people going to be more effective that have that kind of experience? That's quite possible. Yeah. And so people getting into that line of work without any spiritual work or any kind of um personal psychedelic experience. I don't know. I mean, it's not as easy. It's not as simple as, ever, you know, it's not like, oh, okay. Sure. You know, the, yeah, maybe, you know, you'll, you'll have a successful business doing that kind of thing and, and help a lot of people, you know, maybe you could be more effective. Mm-hmm. And so as when the clients are deciding, I want to go to this one, or I want to go to that one, you know, how good they are does factor in. It's not just like it's coming down the pipeline you know, and we got to eat it however it comes. I mean, it's still, sure. it's currently, <laughs> yeah, right. It's currently a uh, cash business, uh-huh. ketamine assisted therapy, for example. And so no one is obligated to go at all. And uh, the trials are, you know, they're clinical trials. So all these people who want to get in on the game and be part of it and do it, it's like, well, they don't really know what they're talking about, you know? It's just a lot of talk. It's like so many, we watch so many ventures or like 
you know, flopping and folding because they, I don't know, they were more interested in just the, the ramping up and the scaling out and the, you know, the expansion of what they thought was just so easy. Right. And then it wasn't. Like you work at a rehab related place right now. There's like, mm -hmm. I say it all the time. There's no major brand name rehab that's like nationally. There's a, some places that maybe are well known and famous because of the, but maybe the cost or the money involved. Mm -hmm. But it's not like, you know, outside of the community stuff like AA, you know, some of the community driven things. So the idea that a business is going to monopolize such treatments, like we have not seen anyone pull that off. And what is so specialized and so personalized. Yeah. And so, I don't know. There's no real, I just think there's a lot of hoopla, not much, you know, beyond that. In a year, is that person still going to be involved in this kind of work and this kind of business? Is it really interesting enough to them? Do they like it? Do they want to keep doing it? You know? it is a factor of why people stay in a line of work. You know, it's not just cause this is like the thing. Right. And like he mentioned earlier in the conversation, the, the sort of the key of the heart opening aspect, you know, that, that whatever it is that you're, that you're doing, um, that there's, and that the psychedelic medicines help with that opening of the heart and, you know, help, help, to help you be more empathetic, help you be more supportive that these, the ceremonial setting is, you know, this place where the heart can open and be vulnerable. I think sort of on a, you know, like uh, on a somewhat related topic to what I just asked, I'm, I'm also curious about, you know, I've, I, I feel like a lot of people when they first start to have psychedelic experiences, um, there's often a, impulse to work with the medicine you know they come out of like a peak experience and they're like the medicine told me i'm supposed to serve the medicine you know or yeah. i'm supposed to become a shaman i'm supposed to do this do that and I, i'm never gonna discourage someone from that but like sometimes i like to sort of gently have the conversation of like well this is you know that's not going to make your life any easier in fact you're you're setting yourself up for you know a path of a lot of a lot of your own work, like you were saying earlier, you know, and I'm curious, why do you think that that is that, that so many people have those peak experiences and then feel called to make that their, their own work. And what would you, what would you just say to somebody yeah, in, yeah, in that yeah. situation? I think that there's like, um, you know, it happens like anytime that somebody, let's say somebody has a big impactful experience, you know, with anything, it feels extremely meaningful to you and as we're all trying to find guidance in our lives and you know sometimes it's like the things that we feel are so meaningful we think well that's that's what i should do yeah and that that was the most meaningful thing i have been a part of you know right. whether that was like playing baseball or whatever you know and so when you have these huge experiences and and then and maybe maybe it was like you know maybe maybe turn somebody around you know in their mental health or their physical health or something really major or relationships and so it's really a big deal and so it is common it always happens it happens like throughout time and so a part of it is just the inexperience of the culture because in like in peru you know at the ayahuasca healing center or the the spiritual center i worked at where there was ayahuasca ceremony Niwerao, and other centers like that that happens all the time right. and that's like once a week Somebody will say that, <laughs> right? You know, once a week, somebody's going to say that. And so one difference is like within a cultural context like that, where, you know, that's so common. So everyone with the shaman, whoever can say, well, you know, that happened last week to that person, or just kind of put it in perspective. That it's like, that's great that you had such a powerful experience, but it's like, you know, that may just be a little flash in the pan. You know, um, and like you said, the, this path, if you want to really go down this path, it's very long. So the person that's like excited about it for a day or two has a little crush, like that might turn out and might not. So it's like, you know, the person that says, oh, I love this, 
I want to learn this. It's like, it doesn't matter to the people that do that. You know, it's like when people say, I'm a doctor. Say like, oh yeah, I could have gone to medical school. You know, like I, I was thinking about going, it's like, okay, that's cool. You know, and I respect that. But it's like, then to go is like years. Right. It's like, so what, from where you're saying you want to do it to what it is, is so far away that it's just like, it's just like, it's an idea that you're floating out there. So then I tell them like, they, that's cool. You know, I think that's kind of thing evolves over time. And so that reveals itself over time. And I say the people that I know that have stuck with it, you know, it's a slow process, very slow process. The people that were so excited and so like, you know, few, a few do come through like that. A lot don't. So that's a, there's that to reflect on. Like, that's what I've observed. You know, and then, you know, the last piece, which I'll bring up from my friend Sochi and her teacher in Colombia from their tradition and their experience of watching people go through, you know, medicine experiences. And, you know, it's not the first time they've seen such a thing. And they say, if this medicine is making you feel more special than everyone else or more, you know, unique or more, you know, just something so extraordinary compared to the rest like it's not working. This should be making you feel more integral to everything that's happening. So if that starts to happen to you, that you start really getting carried away and kind of that manic tendency of like why you are the chosen one and it's so special for you to do this, then you're not really like connecting at the deeper level. And so it's something to, to investigate. Yeah, definitely. So you just mentioned integral. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you that before we wrap up is, you know, what what are some ways that that you guide or suggest to the people you're working with to help them integrate the healing and the experiences they're having with uh, with these medicines, whether it's ayahuasca or ketamine or breath work, whatever it is, because some of the healing is happening within that medicine experience. But sometimes it seems like the medicines are shining a light. They're saying like, hey, here's the direction you need to go in outside of the ceremony or outside of the therapy. Um, so what are what are some of those things that have been helpful? Yeah, I think, you know, things I repeat all the time are like some of the traditional perspectives. You know, so one of the Navajo wisdom keepers that we know here in Phoenix and their attitude is like instead of set and setting and then the journey and then the integration they call it like how do you approach it with love the experience itself is the gift and then afterwards is the responsibility of the gift Mm. so there should people also treat it that way that what you receive in your medicine experience is something that you have the opportunity to to take advantage of and work with and or to disregard and that the experience itself is not enough to change your life and that that's a that's a basic fact and an experience of observing many people go through such things so then you know she people style ricardo always said you know take care of your medicine like you have received some medicine now take care of it if you go back and you whatever start doing the same drugs or this or that and You know, you're going to wash it out. You're going to wash it out what you just what you just gained. And so in the Shipibo style, they have, you know, they do it in the dieta. That you're in this diet period where you're integrating all day, every day in retreat. You know, that you only instead of like ketamine, like go to the clinic, you know, Uber home. It's like, no, you live there. So the retreat, I think, is a very valuable way to take advantage of of the altered state because the science is also supporting this you know idea of an afterglow period with an associated neuroplasticity window where it may be easier for you to change some of the ways you're thinking and acting and being you know if you were to really kind of lean into that afterglow, you know, critical window period. 
And so the idea is that in Shipibo style, okay, you're in a retreat, like extended retreat, you know, a few weeks to be in the process. And Navajo, like ceremonies, you know, when they do ceremony for somebody and they say, oh, they, they basically had this ex experience that makes them kind of like a holy person, that they've touched the sacred. And so now they need to be treated like a holy person for, you know, four to five days. That for the following four to five days, they don't work. They need to be like cooked for and fed for, and they just need to sit and integrate and really take in what they've been through. So those are some like traditional concepts around that. Um, then in those traditional communities, of course, there are people who have access to the people they were in ceremony with on a more regular basis, you know? So it's like, so to be able to talk and share and communicate with people about what you went through that can understand and relate to what you went through is really important for people, you know? And so, that is tough when people go and have an experience and then they go to their job or their family and they can't talk about it. Right. And there it's very common, you know, and they're very, like, it's, it's very tough for it to gain traction. There's some room for it to slip. So you need to process. And so like in the ketamine therapy research world, there's seem to suggest that like, yeah, if you can get them to process like within a day or two, that it's, the, the, the word on the street is that it's very helpful to take advantage of that, you know, that, that, that space. And so there's the processing, there's the communal support, social support. Do you have somebody, you know, that you can talk to about this? If you don't, is there, do you, is there access to a coach or a therapist or someone, clergy person, someone that can help you to keep working on what you're doing? You know, so those are like some very basic things. And then there's all the rest. So it's like, you know, there's in Phoenix, there's our community is like starting restarting. People are doing like, you know, integration circles. So people can come together once a month and talk and connect with the community that's ready to share and learn from each other and exchange, you know. And then there's the more, you know, direct and personal stuff that really integration practices like what I'd send a lot of people to. If I see somebody that's gone through something big and they need to, you know, further support, like somatic experience therapy is, is, a, is, is, it can be very powerful, you know, psychotherapy with the right person, the therapist that's open to all this stuff, um, you know, internal family systems you brought up. It's like, there's been a lot of internal family systems kind of interaction and bridge work with the psychedelic treatments. And so there's people have experience with, you know, working off of breath work, same thing, right. you know. So those are some basic experiences. Then there's more simple, like, you know, spiritual practices that people can do that research supports, like, you know, mindfulness practices, you know, contemplative prayer, uh, gratitude journals. You know, those are simple things like they, they did. They've done research with gratitude journal where just, you know, guided to write down five things you're grateful for every day um, as a simple practice to help you integrate. So I think there's a lot of things to do. I think you want to, you know, have something in place um, for yourself that, yes, it's going to make a big, big difference to have some way, some place to take it and and that it's traditionally would be regarded as, yeah, you're really taking a big risk to not have anything in place. Right. Because most of the time it can wash out. <laughs> I remember going to work in my office when I still worked in an office on Monday and we would have like a team meeting and my boss would go, so what did, who wants to share what they did over the weekend? <laughs> I'd be sitting there just saying, I have no idea even how to approach that question at this right. point. <laughs> right. And that, but that's going to start changing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's going to start changing and then that'll be, and that's the part of what we were talking about. Yeah. Because what happens to the culture when, when that's not so crazy? to talk about i saw right. somebody at the uh, in phoenix which i don't know I, this was just kind of a surprise but it's like okay the maps conference was so big uh-huh and so that something that big it like has ripples of just size and so then i was at whole foods in phoenix and somebody came up to me and they're like oh my god you're you know i saw you talk at the maps conference and it's like having this at the supermarket you know like it was just like part of what happened 
in the culture, you know, it was like, it's, it was big. It had a lot of people were involved. And so it's like 12, oh, that's like a big concert, you know, a big something. Right. So like it, people. So it's definitely changing a little bit, you know, it's so like we say, as those conversations start getting more okay and the knowledge about like how that healing can work or help or that spiritual growth can work or help and the kind of ways that people realize, Oh, I need to be, well, the last piece I'll just throw out there is that because these things that we're talking about are vulnerable spaces, mm -hmm. you know, your belief system, um, your, whether or not you had a spiritual experience or existential experience, you know, in your own life, like it's so easy to be misunderstood when you're sharing about that, like in a big open group, public space at the office. It's so easy for people to misunderstand what you're talking about. Sure. So the traditional people would say that's that's very intimate conversation. Right. So you kind of need to be like really in a trusting relationship with somebody to really reveal that much about it. Because that same place I was talking to you about the beginning is like where your hurts and your trauma and your all this stuff is is there when we open up these places. And so hmm. similarly, it can shock another person because that touches into their hot spots. It's like, if we're right. going to go there and they're like, well, I don't want to go there. That's too woo woo. You know, could that mean in some people's subconscious, like I am not ready to expose myself at that level right now. And if you keep trying to expose me at that level, I'm going to get mad. Yeah. You know, like that's part of what's going on with that. And so can we be more discreet? Can we be more compassionate, you know, to realize, yeah, you know, that's better. Like, among the initiated, you know, whatever it can be, you can, but it's like, don't just expect everyone to be okay with it. Right. You know, realize that it's like, even you should be trusting the person you're telling about it. Yeah. Because it, some of it may be crazy. Some of it may be really mysterious and doesn't make sense. And so you need somebody that like can hold that with you and just kind of like a, like a good friend or, you know, that's like, Hey, that, they're really going to listen to you make emotional space for you to try to like feel that out together say, well, what, what was that? You know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's why it's important. And then the idea, and so yes, people get excited and they want to share with everybody and that's, and you know, if they want to help, you know, that's like, it just, for us, it's like, keep it in the medicine. Do you know why you're doing it? Or if you're trying to help everybody and it's helping, okay, I guess that's a good reason. But if you don't know why you're doing it, then maybe slow down. And even, you know, even like within the context of like an integration circle, you know, uh, I always remind people like when you're sharing something, let people know if you want feedback or if you just want somebody to listen, because listening, just listening can be, you know, can be really transformative. And sometimes that's all you need. You're not looking for somebody to like add their two cents in, you know, you're just expressing something that's vulnerable and you know, intimate to you. So I, I appreciate that you, you know, that you brought that in as well. Yeah. It's just like, and so that's another thing, like as we dialogue more and more about this kind of stuff in the society, then people, their sensibility maybe will improve around it, you know? Yeah. Maybe kind of like a little easier for you to see like, Oh, that's maybe their this is their trauma. Maybe it's not, you know, that we just hate each other. It's like, maybe something happened. <laughs> yeah. It's an important thing to remember, you know, it's like a lot of the time, the, the way that people react to you, whether it's the medicine or not is, has nothing to do with you personally. It's right. how they're filtering it through their experience and their traumas and, you know, uh, their protective parts. And we tend to think like, Oh, this is about me and get, then, then there's like a feedback loop, right. Of like, right. Oh, you're upset. So I'm getting upset and, you know, it just sort of builds. But a lot of the time it, I would probably say most of the time, it doesn't have anything to do with you. You know, right. it's, they're, just, having, they're having their own experience. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was uh, this family friend. He's this big guy. And he's hanging out at some bar and, and it's the kind of bar, you know, people that challenge him. He's a big guy. So somebody a little <laughs> drunk comes up, tries to challenge him. And he said his response to the guy was like, 
is, are you okay? Or are you just like naturally aggressive? Like, <laughs> what, what are you doing? You know, like what, you know, this is like, he's thinking, uh, this is not, this is not me. Like right. I'm just walking into this place, you know, it's like, yeah. so either you're something's wrong with you or you're just always like this, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was funny, but yeah. I should get going here pretty soon. Yeah. So before you go, um, how, how should people connect with you? Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Jonathan. Yeah, we have the, the river course, um, all through modern spirit, modern spirit.org, um, modern spirit.org, but it's a seven week class. And uh, it's a lot of fun based on my book, Fellowship of the River. And so that's one of the big things that I'm working on. And we have other retreats and stuff that we're doing, but they're all kind of full dealing with healthcare providers. So that's, that'd be the thing right now to tell about the course to tell about the book. And we'll put that, all that information on the show. And we're page. raising money, by the way, on the, uh, on the website. So modernspirit.org has a number of projects. One of them is our, our reciprocity project, which is raising money to pay for Native Americans to go through ketamine assisted therapy. Wow. And so we've sent a number of people through and, you know, it's like back to this whole bridging of culture and science and spirit. We've had some pretty beautiful results with some individuals, you know, and it's a nice way to try to unload some trauma, you know, mm-hmm. and then take it from there. You know, what, what's going to happen after the trauma unloads, right? And that's what we're talking about. So thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Joe Tafur. It's a pleasure and, you know, got so wonderful to have run into you at the MAPS conference. You know, it's another little ripple uh, led to this interview. And yeah. now people listening uh, or watching are getting the uh, the benefit of that. So, you know, just like you mentioned, uh, everything is interconnected in these really interesting, beautiful ways and ripple rippling out into the rest of the culture. So. Thank you so much for for your time and sharing your wisdom and experience. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Vital Point Podcast. One of the easiest ways you can support the show is by subscribing to my email uh, newsletter so that you don't miss any new episodes, as well as staying up to date on all the different breathwork, meditation, and other healing workshops and offerings that I'm doing online and in person in Tucson. So we'll put a link on the bottom of the show page to that, or you can go to beacons.ai backslash blue magic alchemy to sign up, find out more about breathwork and other offerings. That's beacons.ai backslash blue magic alchemy to stay connected and in the loop. Thanks for watching or listening. And I will see you next time here on the Vital Point Podcast.